Welcome to What Your GP Doesn't Tell You, the podcast for both doctors and patients with me, Liz Tucker. In 1957, a new wonder drug was launched in Germany, marketed as an astonishingly safe sedative. Tragically, this could not have been further from the truth, for this was the drug thalidomide. It would end up being responsible for around 100,000 miscarriages and disabled children. I really thought I knew this tragic story. But this week's guest, journalist Jennifer Vanderbess, in a forensic six-year investigation, has uncovered compelling and shocking new information about warnings that went unheeded, test results that were misrepresented, and has uncovered scores of potential victims who've never before been recognised as harmed by the drug. One of the heroines of this narrative is a dogged and committed FDA reviewer, Dr Francis Kelsey, who's sceptical of the drug, never approved it for US use. However, as Van der Bess reveals in her new book, Wonder Drug, The Hidden Victims of America's Secret Thalidomide Scandal, published by HarperCollins, although the drug was never sold in the States, it was in fact given to American patients who frequently received the drug in a brown envelope or unmarked bottle, so had no idea that they'd been given thalidomide. At the FDA, Dr. Kelsey had been told by the US company seeking approval that the drug had been sent to 37 American doctors for clinical trial. But what she wasn't told was that actually the medication had been sent out to 1,200 doctors, who then passed on thalidomide to other colleagues. The FDA later described this not as a clinical trial, but a marketing scheme, which means tragically, there are also American babies born with disabilities likely to have been caused by thalidomide. I felt that there was so much to reveal in this compelling untold story that this will be the first in a two-part series. But before we get to Jennifer's interview, a brief request from me. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to leave a review on Spotify or Apple, that would be much appreciated. It really helps. You can also become a paid supporter of the podcast at patreon.com slash what your GP doesn't tell you or via PayPal on my website, what your GP doesn't tell you dot com. A huge amount of work goes into both the research and production of this podcast. So even a small amount of money makes a huge difference. And you can find out more information about the pod on my website where you can sign up for the podcast mailing list. Follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker, and on my Substack account, liz.tucker.substack.com. Many thanks. And now back to Jennifer's interview. Jennifer Vanderbess is an award-winning writer and journalist. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and Atlantic. Here's her interview. So Jennifer, thanks so much for joining the podcast today. Thanks, Liz. I'm so happy to be here. So, Jennifer, the story starts with a German company called Grunthal. And not long after the end of World War II, they're actually recruiting a number of ex-Nazi chemists to work for them. Correct. It was a difficult time in Germany. And a lot of those doctors who were very active during World War II were out of employment. And they then developed thalidomide. The idea is that this is an unusually safe drug with no known toxic dose. Correct. Specifically, it's a non-barbiturate. It has a different chemical structure, but performs the same job in the human system. And that's why it was appealing. Barbiturates were very popular as relaxants and insomnia cures. But this had a different chemical structure and therefore escaped the kind of fatal flaw of barbiturates, which is that people could overdose on those. There was this initial idea that actually there was no such thing as a toxic dose of thalidomide. However much you gave to an animal, it survived. Yes. So there's something in pharmacology known as an LD50, which is the dose that would kill half of your experimental animals. And almost every drug prior to thalidomide that was ever proposed, marketed, had a known LD50, right? And you would have to submit this information. What they were saying was that thalidomide uniquely had no LD50, which meant that there was no dose that would kill half your experimental animals. So initially, this drug begins to be tested by doctors, and there seems initially there's a bit of a mixed response. 
Yeah. So what was really interesting in looking at the history of Brunenthal's early research and um, studies prior to their patents is that for a drug that when it when it went on the market was really sold as being this super safe, super wonderful, what I refer to as a wonder drug in the book. If you actually look at the response from the doctors that they gave it to early on for small and short clinical trials, it was not really a robust, you know, across the board enthusiasm for the drug. A lot of doctors who were looking at it early on had questions and concerns. And this was in 1955 that they start testing the drug. Is that right? It's around 55, 56. And the puzzle is, later documents suggest that actually the human testing started earlier back in 1954. So how would we explain that? So there are some letters um, that were discovered in Brunenthal's archives. And these were brought forth in various legal cases in which the Grunenthal research team actually is trying to assure doctors who are raising concerns that, well, this has been used in humans for X amount of time with great safety. And if you look at the date of the letters and you look at the amount of time that they're claiming it's been used in humans, you realize that actually prior to those official clinical trials, it looks like the drug or they were claiming that the drug was actually used earlier. It looks like this was probably exclusive in sanatoriums. This was somewhat standard at the time. People who were hospitalized for mental illness were often used in that era as test subjects for drugs and certainly for drugs that were meant to calm people. Oftentimes, people running those establishments were quite open to say, well, we'll try anything, right? We would love to, you know, help chill our our population. So yes, it does. Again, this is according to their own paperwork. It does uh, suggest that the drug was being administered earlier than their official clinical trials recognize. And obviously given to all of those patients without any form of informed consent. Yes. I mean, uniformly, anyone who was given thalidomide, and to be fair, probably any other experimental drug in that era, was not informed or consenting. Now, I was really interested to see that very early on, in fact, in 1956, a disabled baby girl is born to a wife of a chemist at the company, but nobody at that point connects it with thalidomide. Yeah. So what is really fascinating in the story of thalidomide and heartbreaking is that Grudenthal, the Merrill Company, and distillers in the UK, if you look at the earliest victims in those areas of the babies who were harmed by the drug, they all sort of converged geographically around the headquarters of these drug companies. They were given quite freely. And again, most of the people working in these drug houses appear to have believed what they were told, which is this drug was super safe. Physicians, uh, researchers, salesmen, giving it to their wives, giving it to family members. And so this baby girl born missing ears is the child of a Grunenthal employee. And nobody really thinks at that time or documents that there's a possible connection between her birth abnormality and the drug that she was given. So then the company is beginning to look to overseas deals, and it signs a deal with the US company Smith, Klein and French, but actually they end up rejecting the drug as ineffective. Yeah, so the very interesting piece of the American story, before you get to the drug firm that did eventually try to get it on the market, is Smith, Klein and French meets with Brunenthal, hears about this drug. Everybody in the world at that time is interested in a safer barbiturate alternative, right? And they know that there's a market for this, hands down. They sign a contract with Smith, Klein and French where they will do research on it. Smith, Klein and French begins some animal testing and some human testing. What's really curious about the Smith, Klein and French narrative is that, yes, they eventually officially say that they do not want to put the drug on the market because it's ineffective. Well, which is odd because in about 50 other countries, 50 other drug firms are marketing it as effective and there's no pushback on that. That's not where thalidomide gets its pushback. But they declare it's ineffective. But it takes Smith, Klein and French ballpark nine or 10 months to come around to deciding that they don't want to market it. It later emerges that there are 
possibly a few babies that were born from those small trials where the mothers were given thalidomide and gave birth to babies that have these very specific limb deficiencies known as phocomelia. The limbs are quite truncated that could very well be linked to thalidomide. And that was never reported at the time. So there are concerns, and I, I can relay the concerns of Francis Kelsey and Helen Tausig in the U.S. Those were two doctors who were quite deep in investigating this story at the time. They both appear to be convinced that Smith, Pye, and French actually buried those results. Why would they have done that? Why couldn't they have said, we think there's a major problem with this drug? It's not clear that they didn't say that to Grunenthal, right? I mean, what's interesting when you look at the sort of bird's eye view of thalidomide, of the early contracts, and um, when this was later investigated briefly by the United States Congress, you know, there was a senator who really wanted to see the early contracts between Grunenthal and the drug firms in the U.S., because he thought this might be the answer as to why this information appeared to not be relayed or public. But the conversation has really circled around this issue that the drug firms investigating the drug, part of the contracts with Grunenthal appear to have required the drug firms not to report anything publicly, but to directly relay those results to Grunenthal, a sort of contained sharing of information. So we can't really say what Smith, Klein, and French told Grunenthal, right? What we can say is that what exists as the sort of you know piece of paper formal reason was an issue of efficacy, which Grunenthal itself also did not seem to be concerned with. They continued to market the drug. They did not. There's no evidence that they dug in and did further research to challenge its efficacy. They sort of took that at face value and moved along. So it's a strange part of the story. So after Smith, Klein and French reject the drug, it is picked up by another US company, Merrill. Yes. What we knew as Vic, the big Vapo rub company um, in the United States, had just recently at that time decided that it wanted to really get into pharmaceuticals and it had acquired this mid-sized pharmaceutical company in Cincinnati called the William S. Merrill Company. This becomes then, parent company becomes Richardson Merrill. Two other representatives are in Germany. They meet with Grunenthal and they hear about thalidomide. And it sounds amazing. And, you know, on the surface, why wouldn't it, right? You sit down, you have a meeting, someone tells you we've got a barbiturate alternative. You can't OD on it. Everybody knows the market for these drugs is fantastic. This is, I believe, 1956 or 1957. Grunenthal is relaying that lots of safety testing has already been done on all levels. So to this American firm, and I don't believe they were made aware that Smith, Klein, French had declined the drug. You know, this seems like the greatest opportunity. They can sort of fast track, right? A lot of research has been done. There are a lot of known things about this drug. They can fast track and try to get this on the market quickly and go through FDA approval. So they uh, negotiate and sign a contract with Grunenthal to basically do what Smith, Klein, and French was doing, except they don't back out. They keep going. And they eventually, in 1960, drop a massive application on the FDA's doorstep saying, this is our drug, it's thalidomide, we want to call it Kevinon, and you know, help us get this on the market as quickly as possible. But unfortunately, from Merrill's perspective, it arrives on the desk of a reviewer called Dr. Francis Kelsey, who turns out to be rather thorough. Right. I mean, you know, they're, they're bad luck, our good luck. So, right, the FDA at the time was sort of known essentially for somewhat fast-tracking drug applications. A lot had gone through. There was a lot of evidence that there was not uh, the necessary scrutiny, that there were very cozy, casual relationships between medical reviewers and the pharmaceutical industry. But a woman named Frances Kelsey, who was originally from Canada and um, had been living and teaching and research in the United States for quite a long time, had just moved to D.C. to take this job at the FDA because her husband got a job at the NIH. They moved to D.C. They've got two kids. They set up house. She's a few weeks into this job. She was probably, if not the one of the smartest people in the building at the time. But the assumption was, oh, well, this is already on the market in Germany and dozens of other countries. And this is not meant to be something to challenge me, to, but to make my life easy as a newbie. So she recognizes that there's a certain unspoken expectation that this application will move swiftly. And very quickly, that becomes a problem for her. And she's not able to move swiftly on the application at all. And in fact, the opposite. She begins to hold up the application because she has safety concerns. 
And she's really concerned about a lack of data, what the drugs have been used for, the dosages that have been used, and the sex and the age of patients. Yeah, so the regulations at the time were very clear as to what a pharmaceutical firm had to show the FDA in order to get a drug on the market. And part of that was their clinical research, which is sort of, okay, let us know where this has been tested, on whom, but it's, you really have to give them the micro detail. You're not supposed to summarize and say, we gave it to a lot of people and it was really good. (laughs) They want every piece of paper referring to every patient. If that means a 37 year old female who was experiencing early menopause and had headaches, and it was given to her in 50 milligram doses for three months, once a day, sort of standard of appropriate clinical research. What she sees in the application are that in all these mounds of pages, that's not there. That there is no specific individualized full patient data saying what what each person was treated for, for how long in the dosage is. And so she immediately says, well, I can't approve this. We need more information. So there's a system at the FDA at the time, which is basically after 60 days, unless you have discovered a problem, a concrete problem or danger with the drug, the application sort of automatically goes on the market. She learns about a sort of loophole from a female colleague who had previously had to resign in protest from the FDA, a woman named Barbara Moulton, who's sort of just as fierce and fascinating. Um, she had made a lot of noise about the process at the FDA being quite irresponsible. So these two women befriend each other and Barbara Moulton says, well, you know, you don't have to find something wrong. You can deem it incomplete. You can stall this and force them to give you the safety data you want. So that's exactly what Francis Kelsey does. Right on the 60 day mark, she sends a letter and says, this is incomplete. And here's the information you have to give me. And this sets in motion a year and a half battle (laughs) between her and the pharmaceutical company where she keeps saying, you know, every 60 days, nope, you haven't given it to me yet. And they, of course, get angrier and angrier as this process drags on. And she is put under tremendous pressure. Yeah, she's put under tremendous pressure. The pharmaceutical firms in general were used to a very cozy relationship with medical reviewers where they could have lunch in D.C., sit down, kind of hash it out over some drinks. And, you know, a few hours later, the application will get pushed through. And that is just not the nature of Frances Kelsey. She was there as a medical reviewer. She had a Ph.D., PhD in pharmacology, and she had a medical degree. And again, keep in mind, this was at a time when most women did not have any advanced degrees. So you have to look at the nature of this woman and what she had sort of already been through in her professional life and the standards that she had been held to, to make the progress that she did in those fields. And she just refuses to budge. She's not easily intimidated. And we should say this pressure isn't just coming from the pharmaceutical company. It's also coming from her bosses at the FDA. Yeah, there are indications that they were not protecting her. There were a lot of meetings where the drug firm went over her head and talked to her bosses and complained about her. Interestingly, if it were not for her predecessor, Barbara Moulton, who had made so much noise about all this kind of what she referred to as a kind of corruption and coziness at the FDA, I'm not even sure Francis Kelsey would have succeeded in holding out as long as she did. I suspect the application would have been reassigned to someone else. Barbara Moulton had gone before Congress to say that there were these problems. So the agency was sort of trying to be on good behavior. So even the pressure that she got within the agency to kind of move along on this was, I think, nothing compared to what would have been leveled at her or what would have happened had Barbara Moulton not come in and made some noise before that. It's interesting, isn't it, that there were two women who were so firm on these issues. Was that because at the time, To be a woman in those roles, you had to be so exceptional anyway. Absolutely. When you look back at how many women were admitted to medical school at the time, I mean, it's a fraction, 2% of these classes and Harvard Medical School didn't admit women at all, right? So to get to the place where you're a practicing physician, you have a PhD in pharmacology, you have jumped through some hoops of fire (laughs) and there's no margin for error, right? I mean, if you're working in fields where you suspect that people would much rather give those spots to a man you are not going to make a mistake. I also am not sure that these women had the same aspirations of men in government at the time. I don't know how many women were working in government regulatory positions who then went on to get cozy positions at the companies that they had been previously regulating. That was quite a revolving door for a lot of men in those agencies. So 
there was no incentive, no interest. They looked at these jobs as they were going to be 100% pure guardians for safety, regulators, protectors of, you know, the average person. And that was the career that they saw for themselves. Whereas I think some of their male counterparts certainly saw those jobs as gateways to something more lucrative. So they saw their jobs as doing the right thing, as opposed to what can I do to advance my career? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is a time when the pharma company profits are shooting up across the world. I think in the US, you say in the book that 13 of the top US companies at that time were pharmaceutical making net profits of between 33 to 38%. Those are huge profits. Yeah, the markups were extraordinary. And around that time, you know, we had a senator from Tennessee who had, before the thalidomide scandal, started to research pharmaceuticals and was discovering exactly that, that the the markups were just unlike anything you would see in any other industry. And what concerned him, and again, we're, we're still having this conversation today, the problem hasn't gone away which is that in in a field where we think of it commonly as, well, medicine is designed to help people, right? To help ailments, heal people's bodies. He recognized immediately, well, there's something a little concerning when the profit margin is so extraordinary that there might be incentives to cut corners, to do things that are not in service of healing people, but in service of making more money. And that conversation starts in 1959. And again, we're still having it today. But this this represents a very interesting episode where that kind of comes to the surface for the first time. People start realizing, oh, pharmaceuticals aren't just lovely little companies, you know, doing research and coming up with cures and then doctors handing them out, right? It's much more complex than that. And I think today, illustrated by this story too, certainly one of the key issues is transparency of evidence. Because if we're making these decisions, the problem that we still have today is much of that information remains proprietorial. So even the drug regulatory agencies don't get to see it all. Right, it's interesting, the the word proprietary comes up a lot in the history of pharmaceuticals, and it has long been used as a kind of catch-all phrase by different firms at different times to explain why they can't share information, the suggestion being that it would make them vulnerable to unfair competition if they shared that. It was a fierce battle in 1959 for this Senate subcommittee to actually get information on how much these firms paid to make certain pills. Um, They knew how much they were sold for. That was easy to get. But to get the manufacturing costs and really look into discovering what the profit margin is, the firms fought tooth and nail not to let that information go public. Now, one of the concerns that Frances Kelsey has at the FDA when she's looking at this information is the detail about the drug's absorption. Can you explain why that matters? Yes. Pharmaceuticals boom after World War II. So alongside that, alongside chemistry, people realize, well, we should actually have a field of study looking at what these chemicals do once they're inside the human body. And so this becomes an issue because if a drug stays in your system, rather than passing through your system, it's going to operate differently. And so this is just something she's generally, as a pharmacologist, alert to. So she looks at this and she says, well, where is your understanding or explanation of how this works in the human body? And the answer she gets is basically, well, we don't know. Um, And this becomes a very interesting refrain through several years of questions, which is that that wasn't something they had particularly looked at. And so the question arises, they also knew that the drug was at least reported to sedate humans, but it didn't seem to have the same effect on animals. Early rodent testing did not indicate that mice really went to sleep taking thalidomide. So then she realizes, well, this is concerning because if you have two different species responding differently to the drug, It's possible that the reason that happens is that it's just being absorbed differently. But that was the question that the drug firm could not answer for her. This becomes a sticking point for her. Because if the animal model doesn't replicate what happens in humans, it's not helpful. It's not helpful, exactly. And gradually, data is starting to emerge suggesting that thalidomide causes peripheral neuritis, which basically is damage to the peripheral nervous system. Things like tingling, numbness dizziness. Right. Yet in Germany, it's marketed as 
I think the word was astonishingly safe. Astonishingly safe, right. So this is a really interesting moment in the story. Frances Kelsey, you know, she's asking this drug firm all these questions. She deems their uh, application incomplete. She wants more data. And their storyline is, sure, sure, you know, sure, we'll get it. Everything's great. Represent her as just being unduly problematic. She gets back to work in like January 1961, which is just a few months after this application has landed on her desk and you brought about questions for her. And she sees an article in the British Medical Journal written by a Scottish physician who has been administering thalidomide to his patients for quite some time and taken it himself. And he says, I think this drug has a huge problem. I think it's connected to exactly the symptoms that you mentioned, this sort of painful tingling in the extremities. And he's very concerned. This really becomes an issue. And this sort of becomes a big turning point for Frances Kelsey, where she realizes, first of all, this was a this publication arrived because of a mail strike quite delayed. So the first thing she realizes, well, this article and this information appears to have been discussed and known in some capacity several months before she started raising her questions. And she has not heard a single word about it from the American drug firm trying to get the application cleared. And this is the moment where no longer in her mind a question of sloppiness and becomes a question in her mind of very suspicious withholding of information. And it's really interesting, Liz, that you bring up peripheral neuritis because I think when people do talk about thalidomide nowadays, they speak about the history of the story. We we do talk about the sort of larger, more dramatic side effects, which were the birth abnormalities. But I do think people overlook that there was a very problematic, painful long-term medical condition that this drug was connected to before the conversation about birth abnormalities even started and has not been as broadly discussed. But she becomes aware of this and she becomes very suspicious of the pharmaceutical firm and it only makes her demand more and more information. And Jennifer, the doctor who reports the cases to the BMJ, says he himself who's taken the drug, that he's suffered excruciating cramp and pins and needles and that even after stopping thalidomide, while his cramp ends, his pins and needles continue. Also, a UK neurologist reports a patient suffering agonising pain, which again doesn't end when the drug is stopped. Yeah. So Jennifer, in the UK, patients and doctors have access to thalidomide from 1958 onwards when it's approved for use. And I think Distillers Biochemicals becomes the UK partner for the drug. Exactly. So Distillers does exactly what Richardson Merrill in the U.S. did. They, you know, sign a similar contract. They are enticed by the the idea of this astonishingly safe sedative. They see a market for it, and they are doing the same thing. They just get started a little bit earlier than their American counterpart. So they've got the drug on the market at that point. It's an astonishing statistic that you quote that you say that the UK is in the middle of a sedative craze, and sedatives make up twelve percent of NHS prescriptions at that point. Yeah, I mean, and this is emblematic of how that type of drug was doing in the market at that time. I mean, what what really appealed to the pharmaceutical firms about sedatives is it doesn't treat one medical condition. You know, it's an across the board, men can take it, women can take it, people of all ages can take it, I mean, ostensibly, right? Um, You can take it for insomnia, you can take it for anxiety. You know, they... They see an opportunity for drugs that can be sort of taken daily, almost like a vitamin. And so the market share of this class of drugs really starts showing itself its profit potential very quickly. But it feels a little bit like there's a missed opportunity in the UK because the British animal tests, which are done, show that there's no sedative action, but that the drug seems to block thyroid action. And in fact, the researcher at the time says, He believes it needs more testing, but due to the limited window because of the deal with Grunthal, they go ahead. Yeah, there's this very compelling figure in the history of distillers. When they cut this deal with Grunenthal, they realize they need to actually have a pharmacologist on staff. And they hire this guy named George Somers, who in what I research really is a sort of tragic figure in that particular story, because he quite early on, I mean, he's delegated to really just get some formal animal testing done and then sort of oversee the process of getting thalidomide to the market. And really from the get-go, he starts saying, I don't think this drug works the way Grunenthal is saying it does. 
he finds that there's a possible toxicity with it, that this astonishingly safe drug that supposedly can't kill an animal actually can. If administered with sucrose in the right carrier, it can have devastating effects. And he becomes alert to this. He starts tracking the clinical reports that come in. And there are doctors in the UK saying this drug, it looks to be problematic in conjunction with the human thyroid. But as you see with all the pharmaceutical companies, there was a um, a pattern of kind of shrugging off the questions and the information that did not align with what they wanted to hear. And frankly, what I think in their mindsets, they would have already been told like, well, the drug is safe. We've been told this. It's been on the market in Germany. And you see them trying to sideline these reports of any possible harm that could be connected to thalidomide. And then I think critically importantly, a study is really misrepresented that reports that side effects from thalidomide aren't observed in mothers or babies, but it fails to make one critical point clear, which was that the drug hasn't been administered to a single pregnant woman in the study. Yeah. I mean, the most stunning piece of this story is how most people administering the drug and many people within these companies were under the impression that it had been tested for pregnancy safety. And all it takes is going back and looking at the German data that's vaguely related to pregnancy, but it's postpartum nursing women. And of course, this turned out to be a drug that has um, disastrous effects have taken within the first trimester of pregnancy. There is just this constant, believe it's safe during pregnancy. We believe it's fine. Every indication suggests there's no issue. There are doctors asking this question. And I think that's a really important piece of this story. It is not like there were not obstetricians who pieced together the possibility that this drug could affect an embryo. In fact, a man within Grunenthal, right, and the records show that one of their own researchers tried early on. His wife had just gone through a pregnancy. All evidence indicates that he was actually trying to get a study off the ground to make sure that it was safe for pregnant women. And he just doesn't have success getting that study done. And then it appears that nobody wants to stop the, you know, the fast train of this new drug to wait for that. So they get this alternate study on nursing mothers. And they sort of use that as their, hey, look, it's it's okay for everyone in every stage of life. And the story of pregnancy research kind of ends there. As questions emerge, I think this is really important to the story. They're getting questions. They're getting letters. Doctors are telling the salespeople, wait a second, I know of three women in this town and they took thalidomide and Contragen was the German name for it. And the babies have these very sort of noticeable limb differences. Is there a connection? What you don't see is a moment where anyone hits pause and says, oh, actually, we can't say for sure and we have no data on that. Let's take a beat and look into this. That never happens. The questions come, the questions are dismissed. The questions come, the questions are dismissed, you know, in, until you get to the end of 1961, and doctors and parents have taken it upon themselves to sort of make so much noise about what this, the connection they believe that exists between this drug and these uh, birth situations, and the story turns dramatically. So still in the States, Dr. Francis Kelsey hasn't approved the drug, but and I think that's where there's been a misunderstanding for some time. That doesn't mean that the drug wasn't widely circulated in the States because the company Merrill is able to basically give out free samples of the drug, quasi, I suppose, clinical trials. If they call their doctors clinical investigators and suggest that they are going to be running some form of clinical trial, the drugs can be given out. I think they go out to 1,200 doctors. Yeah, Liz, thank you for asking that question. I mean, I think the heart of the American story is really lost in the misuse of language. People always say thalidomide was never approved for use in the Ameri- in the United States, which is absolutely true. And then they will say it was available in clinical trials, which is maybe sort of technically true, but is such a dramatic res- misrepresentation of what those trials were. What I would say, and what's really key to the story, when Merrill submits its application to sell thalidomide as Kevin on the United States, it's September of 1960. 
The paperwork that lands on Francis Kelsey's desk tells her that 37 physicians across the United States are conducting clinical trials on this drug. 37 is not a ridiculous number. She's already noting that these 37 trials are not being conducted to the standard that she would expect of reporting on human testing for a drug. What she does not know is that while she's sitting going through this paperwork complaining about the lack of you know, data from these 37 doctors, Merrill has actually distributed the drug to a number that they peg eventually as 1,200. And I would double that for a very good reason. They send their entire sales force out around the country to do this crazy thing, which these salesmen have never done. They have a very straightforward job. Usually it's like, we've got a new drug. Here's some samples. Go talk to a doctor and see if you can interest him. This time they bring all these guys to Cincinnati. They get them in the conference room and they're like, look, we actually don't have FDA approval, right? But we'd really like you to sort of get things moving on this drug. So what we need you to do is go to like every major hospital in the U.S., try to figure out who the biggest, most popular, prominent doctors are there, go visit them, and then tell them that because you think they're so important, you want to give them sort of early access to this drug that is just about to get FDA approval. So Francis Kelsey is looking at sort of murky paperwork of 37 clinical investigators. Meanwhile, Merrill's got his whole sales force out door to door. They use the words clinical trial. They tell these doctors that's sort of what it has to be called, but they also tell them not to worry about reporting any actual data. And this is where everything goes off the rails because what happens is these 1,200 doctors think this sounds great. And what they start to quickly do, and this, this is a problem certainly within hospitals, is they get their samples and then they circulate them. They go to the pharmacy, they go to colleagues. So that initial list of 1,200 doctors is a wild misrepresentation of the number of physicians that were actually dispensing the drug. And I'm sure when we get to the story of what actually happened in survivors in the United States, this is why you have so many Americans who were harmed by this drug, whose mother's obstetricians are not on that list of 1,200. And it makes perfect sense when you understand what the process was for what are called clinical trials, but was really, even according to the FDA later on, the FDA said this was a marketing scheme. This was not research. This was a marketing scheme. And we should say, and the patients being given these drugs weren't even aware necessarily that they were being given thalidomide. No, a lot of these women, the drug was not on the market. You know, the name was not anywhere in popular conversation, right? So what most of these women were handed was an envelope or an unmarked bottle that would say really just when to take the drug. That's it. And so they were not told at the time that it was experimental. Um, They were not told the name of it. Again, this is where the story gets really heartbreaking. They were not told after the fact, once the drug's dangers were known, that the pills that they had in their envelopes and their unmarked bottles were the thalidomide that was then finally making news. So at the start of the 60s, more and more data is emerging that thalidomide may not be as safe as has been marketed. And there's pressure on Grunthal to make the drug prescription only, which will give some control, that they hold out against that. But then we have two doctors who become pivotal to the story. There's a German doctor and also an Australian doctor. Can you explain about that? Yeah. So you have a pediatrician who specializes in genetics in Germany, Whittakin Lenz, who is approached by a father, Karl Schult Hillen, in Germany. And Karl Schult Hillen's son has been born with what we would ascribe to very sort of typical folk amelia. There's a limb deficiency that was very obvious at birth. What really rattles Karl Schult Hillen is that he has a niece who has been born within a short span of time uh, with similar, similar limb abnormalities. He starts asking around and starts hearing about other babies born similarly. So he's calling and calling and calling and trying to find out, making no headway with the laundry list of typical doctors. And someone puts him in touch with this man, Whittakin Lenz, and says, go see him. Meets up with Lenz. You know, we'd sort of describe it as a bit of a meet cute if we were narrating the movie, which is that they don't quite hit it off the first time. Lenz is suspicious. His line of work as a geneticist, he's commonly approached by parents who think that there's a cause, a reason, something bad happened, and he always has to 
deliver the heartbreaking news and say, this is actually genetic. This is in your family. There's nothing that could have been done to stop this. And this time around, Lens is sort of faced with something really peculiar, which is not just the story of this baby, but the niece and these other babies. And so he starts to investigate. And eventually, they make friends. (laughs) And they team up and they start driving around Germany you know, they place ads in papers, they ask around, they're starting to hear more and more babies born similarly. And they create a survey of all the mothers. And they're trying to figure out like, is there a common link of some kind of exposure? And eventually they land on all of these women or the majority of them having a recollection that they took something for insomnia, anxiety, morning sickness, and it's a drug called contragen, right? Which is the German form of thalidomide. At the same time, in Australia, in Sydney, there's an obstetrician um, named William McBride. He has a very busy private practice. He sees lots of pregnant women. And he had been approached by a salesman for distillers in Australia about this new great drug. It was Distival, was the name for it there, uh, that could be useful in his pregnant patients. And McBride had started using it to cure extreme morning sickness, and he believed it was very successful in combating that. And we should just say that initially, McBride is so keen on the drug, he says to Stillers that he will be happy to support any application. Right. I mean, he's a he's a believer, right? I mean, he sees the short term success of this drug and he thinks, well, this is one of the greatest things that's you know landed in my practice. He thinks it's fabulous. Months later, he's called in for a series of troubled births that require C-sections. And in a series of them, you know, weeks apart, He's delivering babies that have these very specific limb deficiencies known as phocomelia. The limbs are quite truncated. And what's important to realize is that this condition is so rare that most practicing obstetricians will never see a single case in their lives. He knows this. In Germany, Wittekind Lenz knows this. They know that the problem is these conditions that are supposed to be super, super, super rare are now appearing with greater and greater frequency and something is going on. So you have Lenz and Schulthelen in Germany going door to door, talking to parents, trying to sort of reverse engineer what's happening there. McBride starts going home frantically looking through his records and he quickly realizes that the common denominator in all the women that he's seeing who have children born this way is that he gave them thalidomide. So he starts trying to conduct animal experiments in a hospital shed. You know, he's determined to prove this. He's going about it his way. And really, almost within a week of each other, Wittekind Lenz in Germany reaches out to Grunenthal in Germany. McBride in Australia reaches out to the distiller's office with this declaration that they are convinced that thalidomide causes birth abnormalities and there must be an investigation. And interestingly, in the German case, you mentioned that because the drug is seen as so innocuous, initially some of the women can't think that they've taken anything because they don't even connect it with the child's problems. Yeah, I mean, it was in Germany, it was over the counter. So this was perceived as something similar to an aspirin. It was not thought of as a kind of, oh my God, I went to the doctor because I had a specific medical condition and the doctor gave me this bottle. It was much more, oh, I wasn't feeling great. I was low on energy or upset about something and I just popped into my local store. In fact, that is very much the story of the Schultelin family was it was a, a loss in the family. Everyone in the family was grieving. Someone popped out to the pharmacy to help everyone just relax a little, comes back with a bottle, which they eventually find. It's a very painful moment in the story when Carl Schultelin, once he and Lenz have figured out that the common link with all these mothers is this drug contragen, and he has to ask his wife and say, did you take this? And they scrounge that. They're suddenly remembering, oh, my God, Lynn, when your father died, remember, someone went to the pharmacy and they scramble, scramble, scramble. And they find this bottle and realize that like the one or two pills that she took one night are what harmed their son. You know, it's a game changer. Because what's shocking is, in some cases, a single dosage of the drug, if taken at a particular time in the pregnancy, could have done the damage. Absolutely. One pill at the right time can do a tremendous amount of damage. It's really when the limbs are developing, um, you could have higher dosages in the third trimester and not see what you do in terms of visible damage to limbs at birth. So Lynn's by this stage convinced he's got evidence that the drug is clearly causing these children's disabilities. So he goes to Grunthal. How do they react? 
Well, the first thing he does is call. And interestingly, he gets on the phone a man named Heinrich Muchter, who is really the sort of father of thalidomide in the history of Grunewald. I mean, he's the one who was sort of overseeing the research initially, oversees the patenting, you know, gets it on the market. And that's who he gets on the line. And it's a very odd conversation as Lenz relays it, which is that, you know, Lenz is in a state of this is an epidemic. Babies are being harmed. You know, stop everything. How many cases had he come across? Oh, that's a good question. I think he knew of hundreds at that point. I don't think he had the specific data on that many. But what he had among his set of women that he had met with and interviewed was this sort of preponderance, this sort of disturbing number of connections to the drug contragen. But at that point in Germany, there were thousands of babies, right? He hadn't found them all and met all these families, but the number was extraordinary. He speaks to Mukhtar on the phone and as Lenz sort of relays it after the fact, there was not a proper <laughs> state of concern or alarm. It was sort of like, well, you know, we'll we'll look into this and get back to you. Someone will call you next week. Lenz, he gets off the call and he's like, I gotta, I gotta write this all up, right? So he sits and he writes his report. He wants to document everything. He he intuitively senses he's about to step into a very dangerous battle zone and he wants to sort of go about this properly and make sure he's documenting everything. He doesn't feel like the pharmaceutical farm is concerned. He gets a call a few days later. They 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 speak again. And the word he gets is that Grunethal is going to send um, someone to speak to him. And this begins a series of meetings that happen at some point independently with Lenz, at some point under the purview of um, German health authorities, in which he is trying to present his case for the link between thalidomide and birth abnormalities. And Grunethal, the drug firm, is trying to discredit him. Essentially, they say correlation, not causation. You have so little evidence. You know, they really try to make it seem like he is being irresponsible and reckless in his accusations. So basically, Lenz is going to take a drug off the market, which is incredibly helpful and safe, and potentially that could do damage. Right. And he's being slanderous. You know, he's he's just casting aspersions on a drug that's been very successful. I mean, it's it is useful to note that, according to records, these meetings under the purview of the German health authorities all pretty much ended with the German health authorities listening to Lenz. They quickly began to share concerns and were asking Grunenthal to take action. And Grunenthal was still not acting to recall the drug from the market. And so other actions were taken by Lenz and his counterparts, which really kind of forced the hand of the firm. So Lenz decides then he has to let other doctors know what's going on. Yes. So Lenz is at a conference. You know, he is so tired of waiting. He is so convinced harm is being done every day. He decides he's going to show up at this Dusseldorf conference of pediatricians and make a bold announcement. And what's interesting about this, of course, is Lenz as a as a man and a character was a very shy, taciturn, <laughs> non-combative. You know, I believe he spoke like eight languages, wrote poetry, liked music. You have to imagine a man like that getting to the point where he's going to kind of storm a meeting of pediatricians and try to sort of alert the medical community. It's quite a bold move. It was risky for him. He does it. He gets a little nervous, I think, at the last moment and decides not to name the drug. He tells everyone there is a drug in wide circulation. We have a lot of evidence suggesting that it's linked to these birth abnormalities. He comes just short of naming the drug. But as soon as his speech ends and he kind of makes his way to the side of the room, all these doctors understandably come up to him. They're like, is it thalidomide? And he says yes. And that changes everything. That's where we leave this week's episode. In part two, the battle to get thalidomide off the market continues across the globe. And the FDA is appalled to discover that although never approved in the US, the drug has been dispensed by over 1,200 American doctors. So they need to find those drug samples fast. Even taking just one pill at the wrong time during a pregnancy can cause fetal disabilities. But the tragedy unfolds further when they find to their horror there are no proper records, so it's almost impossible to say which doctors have got the drug and which patients have taken it. So do join me for part two. Until then, many thanks for listening. And if you've enjoyed the show, if you could leave a review, that would be much appreciated. It really helps. Bye for now.